Well, students, and welcome to my second screencast for your test coming up. This will be on methods of reproduction to cell cycle and mitosis. If you need a little refresher, this is in chapter 10, sections 1 through 3 in your textbook. Your textbook's really good. The Miller and Levine book's excellent and has great animations. I'd recommend you go check it out. If you can explain the animations to a friend or family member, then you truly know the material. Just like all my other videos, this is not for any money, and all the pictures and stuff are available on Khan Academy or they're freely licensed on the internet. All right, my kids are excited for you to learn. Let's go. So some preview questions. I'll let you pause the video and read those. All right, how'd you do? Could you answer them? So who is this lady down here? This is my mother. This is Dr. Donna Mae Fugamoto and me. I'm guessing that I'm five years old in this picture. And she spent her whole life fighting cancer. She's a cancer doctor and it's called an oncologist. And she, you know, motivated me to get involved with science and to work with you all. So I really hope you enjoyed this unit. I hope you enjoyed the Terry Fox research that you got to do in class. And I hope it was more than just listening to statistics about a cancer, right? I tried to get you to look up the actual genes that are mutated in that cancer and then to see what are some of the potential uh, therapies coming down the line, like how does CRISPR work, et cetera. So I hope you got into it. I hope you really enjoyed it. All right, so let's get into just the methods of reproduction as a reminder. So we had asexual, that's making a clone of oneself. So here you can see this bacteria cell, it copies its one chromosome, it then pinches in and makes the clone of itself, right? So what's a good thing about that is it's very fast, right? Bacteria can do this within about 20 minutes in optimal conditions. What's some of the cons? Well, it lacks genetic diversity, right? When the environment changes, the organism can be in trouble. Now, there can be errors in the copying of the DNA. They're not can be, there are, right? And it's called a mutation. And sometimes those mutations do get selected for, such as in the case of antibiotic resistance. Bacteria are also, you know, they're able to promote genetic diversity by essentially high-fiving each other and exchanging DNA and picking up DNA from the environment. Uh, so don't sleep on them. They can do a lot of different stuff. Um, but that's for another video. All right, so asexual, without sex. That's what that prefix A means. So sexual means with sex, and that is dealing with sperm and egg, right? And so here it's going to make a zygote. This is an example for humans. It's not the same for all of them. If you remember the little video about the clownfish, uh, they can be a little different. Same with uh, ants, right? Haploid, diploid cycles, that's pretty interesting. So ants that aren't the queen just have one set of chromosomes. But I'm getting distracted again, so let's keep it on point here. So the pros for this, it gives you genetic diversity, uh, the cons. It's taking up time, right? It takes time to find mates. It requires energy. This is time that could be spent, you know, fortifying uh, your habitat or wherever you live or finding more food. Okay, here is a little reminder about the cell cycle and mitosis. So you have um, prokaryotic cell division, which we just went over, and then you have eukaryotic cell division which consists of interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis. Interphase has G1, where the cell grows, the S phase, where it copies its DNA, and G2, where it gets ready to divide. This takes the majority of the cell's life. Notice how in this uh, graphic over here, it, it takes up a much larger percentage of the model. And in mitosis, is pretty quick. It's got prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Remember the mnemonic I helped you with? P for prep, right? Those chromosomes are coming about. M in metaphase for middle, they line up along the equator. A for anaphase, the chromatids get pulled apart. These are identical to each other. So each cell only needs one of them. And in telophase, T for two. Sorry, my head's covering it up here. Um, I tried to delete this earlier and I had to redo the video. So you just got to deal with it. All right, and in cytokinesis, it pinches in half. Okay. Here is that prokaryotic cell division. This is from Khan Academy and just an excellent uh, example of it happening. So it just copies itself and then it's going to pinch the cell. So I said the word chromosomes, but what is a chromosome? Can you explain it to a friend? So hopefully you remember that a chromosome is a, set, a whole bunch of DNA. It contains genes, right? A gene would be a section of a DNA that codes for a specific protein. Maybe it's your hair or eye color, or it could be enzymes inside of your body. 
So it's not just DNA. It needs to be wrapped up really tightly, kind of like uh, you used to have to wrap up your headphones before everybody got AirPods. And so here's an example. It's wrapping itself around proteins called histones. All right. So that's a chromosome. So do they always exist as those X-shaped structures that we like to draw and that we see on cartoons and movies? The answer is no. Right? And I gave you this example. It kind of exists like spaghetti in here. It's not just random. Areas are more focused on different parts. But the reason it's uncoiled like that is so that way it can be accessed. And so that the genes can be what we call transcribed or put into a message. And then that message can be translated at a ribosome to make a protein. So here they are. These will be condensed. This is called a karyotype. It's a photomicrograph of chromosomes. You can do this to uh, check on baby development, et cetera, or to look for diseases, right? A cancer karyotype looks radically different than this one right here. We order them in uh, size from biggest to smallest, and we match them up. So this would be, I think, uh, the purple was mom and the green was dad. These would be called homologous chromosomes. So these, they all have the same genes on them, as you can see by these banding patterns, but they might have different forms of the gene or different alleles. So let's use an example to make that clear. Maybe your dad has blue eyes and your mom has brown eyes. So dad, they both have the eye color gene. And then dad has, uh, excuse me, mom had brown and dad had blue. And so they would contribute that to you. And then your body would figure it out in a Punnett square. Now, for us humans, usually it's not that simple, right? Uh, genes can be, there can be multiple Punnett squares controlling a gene. It's the level of protein that's secreted, et cetera. All right. I used a lot of terminology there, and I kind of went through it. You might need to replay that or ask me that in class. Also, I do recommend that Amoeba Sisters video that I'm going to put on Classroom that has chromosome numbers demystified. So can you go through this terminology, right? And it's helpful to just know what these words mean so that when we're talking about uh, cells that you can go over them. All right, did you get that haploid HA for half? It's one set of chromosomes. Gametes are sex cells. Dipoid, DI for two, two sets of chromosomes. That would be body cells. So we're dealing with dipoid somatic cells in mitosis. Things like you need to make more skin cells, you need to make more heart cells, or you need to make more liver cells, endothelial cells, etc. All right, we will do the haploid and the gamete cells later on when we do meiosis. Here's another just example in case you are struggling with what we're going over there. This would be one chromosome. This is also one chromosome. This is hard for students to get. These are identical to each other, and we call them chromatids, right? They're identical strands of DNA. So this would be like a chromosome from your dad and then dad, dad, right? They're the same DNA. They're just copied. So that way when they get pulled apart, the cell has the – each new cell has identical DNA. All right, so that's why I kind of drew them – instead of drawing like an X – I drew it a little bit like this in class. I drew so that way it, you can see that this is one and this is one. When students draw them like this, they get a little confused. All right. Let me erase that and let's move on. Okay, do you remember the stages of the cell cycle? So hopefully you got G1, S, and G2. We just went over this earlier and then mitosis and cytokinesis. And here uh, you can see this is a cool little animation that I got uh, from years past from other teachers. So thank you to them. And it's showing just that they're identical daughter cells. Right? They're a little smaller in size, right? The cells have to grow in G1, but they're identical to the parent cell because the DNA was copied and then each one got its own set of it. All right. Can you do it with your hands? Remember that? So G1, S, we copied it. G2, we're getting ready. P for prophase, we're getting ready. M for middle, we line up all of our chromosomes in the middle. So this was P for prep, M for middle. A for away, we're starting to pull the chromosomes apart. Right? These are identical chromatids. Uh, A for away, T for two. So we got them in two cells and in cytokinesis. So one more time if you needed it, G1, S, G2, prophase, metaphase, 
in the middle, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. All right, so a semen action. You can actually divide them up into uh, even more stages, but it, for our class, that's good. So here's early prophase. The chromosomes are condensing, so the spaghetti-like DNA is condensing into strict chromosomes, so they can get popped, uh, so they can get pulled apart. And then the centrioles come out, and they're getting ready to secrete these microtubules. These are going to be these fibers that are going to help that the chromosomes are going to travel along. All right, here. They're getting ready. The nuclear uh, envelope or the nuclear membrane breaks down so that this can take place. Um, this is a good picture. So these are called kinetochores where the spindle fibers attach to chromosomes. The centromere, you can think about it like a button on a shirt, right? It's going to keep them together right here in the middle. Remember, students, that these are identical strands of DNA. Here you can see the homologous pair. Right? They're the same size. They have the same genes. They may have different forms of the gene. Let's pretend red's from mom, purple's from dad. Okay? But these strands, students, are identical to each other. These strand, This bottom strand is identical to the top strand. Right? And that's important to understand. If you're having trouble with that, you need to come in and model that with me with the Play-Doh like we did in class. And we did it with pipe cleaners as well. All right, so here they are. They're lined up in the middle of the cell in metaphase, and then they get pulled apart in anaphase. So this is kind of cool. There was a science experiment in the University of Wisconsin to figure out, are they pulled, or does something walk them along these lines? And I'll let you figure that out. Who knows? Maybe it could be a bonus question. Telophase, T for two, right? The nucleolus reappears, the nuclear membrane reforms. So look, you have, it's starting to become spaghetti-like again. You have the chromatids pulled apart, but they're identical. This one was identical to this one. So each cell has the DNA it needs, All right? In plant cells, a cell wall forms in the middle. In animal cells, it literally pinches off. Cells don't always have to divide, right? They can exit and they go to what's called gap zero, a resting stage. So this would be an example of a brain cell, right? That has exited cellular division. All right, I'm going to take you real quick through some of the Play-Doh models we made. So here, this would be the homologous pairs. So here's the homologous pair of chromosomes. Here they are, uh, chromatids. So this would be 2n is equal to 2, right? And so here are the two chromosomes. Here they are, the centrioles get them. They start to pull them apart, and bam. Each cell is like the parent one, right? Just a little smaller, so it's going to need to grow. Okay, so how is this all regulated? Well, there's, there's, we watched a video on it. We did that activity in class from HHMI where we label different genes as oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. I thought that was pretty cool. We saw, um, we also did a click and learn on P53. I was just trying to show you some of that kind of AP level stuff. For this test, this has been so long, I mainly just want you to know what's down here. Right, dealing with oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, and genome maintenance. So cancer is when we can't control this. And either the gas pedal gets stuck, and it's called an a oncogene, or the tumor suppressor genes don't work, so the brakes don't work. There's three checkpoints that are going to, you know, just kind of like a stoplight. They're going to make sure everything's okay. And if something isn't okay, it's going to leave the red light on. It's going to say stop. And then we're either going to fix it or the cell is going to uh, be labeled for destruction. Now, it's not just as simple as going right to a stoplight and then getting waved on, right? Cells, this is controlled by uh, proteins. And so there's lots of proteins rising up in the cell. There's been a lot of cool experiments where cells have been fused together at different stages in the cell cycle. And you can see things happen from these proteins. So here's one of the checkpoints. The G1 is checking for that the cell is the right size. It's got nutrients. It has the growth factor. So essentially, it's been communicated with that it should grow, and it doesn't have DNA damage. Here you can check out some of those guiding questions from Khan Academy. G2 checkpoint is making sure, okay, was that DNA done right? Was it copied okay? Did we have this, you know, really big errors? Um, and we get ready to divide. The spindle checkpoint in metaphase is checking to make sure they're all lined up correctly. 
So I want you to think about students, what would happen if they aren't lined up correctly? What would happen to the daughter cells? What would happen if they got extra DNA or uh, they were missing chromatids? Now those checkpoints sound kind of simple. I want to show you this would be at an AP level, right? What's going on in a cell? So these cyclins, these are actually proteins. And so they're being made. And when enough of them are made, they're combined with these cyclin dependent kinases and they're all activated. They start phosphorylating these targets. What does that mean? It means they add a phosphate group. And if you remember when we talked about ATP, this is kind of like giving them energy to do something. So these three targets now start doing stuff. So they might do things like break down the membrane or help to line up the chromosomes or start moving stuff around. So this is what's going on. It's not just as simple as a check. Here I told you that karyotypes, uh, you can see what happens when you have cancer. Look at how much different this one looks than this one. So what are some of the causes of cancer? This is actually a slide that I got in college from my college professor. And so you could have those defective DNA repair mechanisms. I went over that Google Docs, right? If the spell check isn't working, then you're going to be in trouble. You can have a normal proto-oncogene turn into an oncogene. This is when the gas pedal gets stuck down or a tumor suppressor gene, there's no breaks on that cellular division. And so if it does, if we can't repair it, the cell could be cancer. If you can repair the cell, it could be a uh, return to normal duty. And if it's really bad, maybe your cell will just label it for cell death. Here is uh, the picture from HHMI of what we looked at in that video dealing with uh, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes and genome maintenance. All right, and these are some famous tumor suppressor genes over here, P53 and retinoblastoma, and then here's some uh, proto-oncogenes. All right, here's an, another example of it. This is actually on an AP test not too long ago. So you can see here's, this is the signal. This is called a ligand. It's going to hit a receptor, and it's going to say, hey, let's do something. Let's make more cells, okay? There's an empty space here. We need to grow. Or uh, where you're a growing young adult, you need to make more cells. Here, no growth factor present. Okay, don't divide. It's not time to do it. Not good. Well, if there's a mutation and that proto-oncogene becomes an oncogene, here this RAS is always on. When that RAS is always on, it keeps dividing the cell and it makes cancer. So here's a little diagram how P53 can work. P53 can check. It sees that there's DNA damage. And so it makes a CDK inhibitor. So it stops the cell from going on. Um, and it deals with another protein called P21, which is pretty cool. All right, here's my daughter. You know, I'm hoping, um, well, I hope all my kids can grow up and help work on this. And I put, put a picture of Jules. You know I hate Jules and uh, sometimes rant and rave about them in class. But um, we know a lot about the science of cancer is prevention depends largely, if not exclusively, on political action. Getting rid of things that can cause radiation and passing laws that can make people safer. So I, I went a little fast there at the end, you know, pause and rewind and go through. I've got to, um, getting really pumped for DO, so I can't recut the video, but I hope that this helped you. And if not, you know, come to my review session. We can go over it some more and take care.